Thank you, Chulin, the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to thank God for the gift of life and the opportunity that we have once again to be together on the Sabbath. We are still continuing with our theme um, on the Holy Spirit. And as we continue, I trust that you are well and that you are blessed in the different places where you may be joining us from. Now, we are in the book of Acts chapter 1 and we are reading from verse 1. To eight in the book of Acts, and it says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus uh, began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles from uh, whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. Uh, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the father which as he said you have heard from me for John truly baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, when will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. The Lord blesses the reading of his word. The book of Acts forms the second of the letters that are written by Luke. Now, Luke was not part of the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ, and there is not much evidence to help us understand how he even came to know of Jesus. But what we do know is that he believed in Jesus as the Savior, and he wholeheartedly witnessed to this belief. In the first of his work, named after him the Gospel of Luke, he begins by telling us that what he is writing is a properly researched account with evidence. And it appears that the gospel according to Luke is actually the first academic approach to the gospel. It is the first time that a writer is doing research. The writer themselves do not bear personal witness of Jesus Christ. What they bear is their own faith in him. However, in order to substantiate their faith, Luke takes the approach of a researcher, a, an approach of an academician, because what he wants to do, he wants to set up a coherent story about the Jesus that he believes in. The question is, what, who is he doing this for, or why is he even doing it? In the Gospel according to Luke, he tells us that he is writing to Theophilus. There have been a number of theories about who Theophilus was. For starters, there are those who go with the title. Luke says, I write to you, dear Theophilus. Now, in modern day terms, we use the word dear to mean someone that we are being affectionate to. However, in their days, it was common that the word dear was actually used to address someone who was very important. In today's terms, when we write a letter, a, a client and a business, dear Mr. So-and-so, when we are writing a letter to our relatives, dear aunt or dear uncle. In other words, today, 
we use the word dear more to either show affection or to respect. But in their days, it was a, a bit more than that. Dia was reserved particularly as a salutation for individuals who held uh, uh, some important offices. So it would not just be used as a, a, a respect to a general person, but to someone of great importance. And so the first theory suggests that Theophilus was either a Roman or a Greek official who was somehow related to Luke. And Theophilus may have heard of Jesus through Luke. But Theophilus, knowing that at that time, Jesus was not a popular figure to either believe in or to even worship. Theophilus may have wanted to first know about Jesus, but secretly. And so Theophilus may have challenged Luke, whether Theophilus was Luke's best friend or maybe a relative within the family. But what is clear is that Theophilus wanted some form of coherent story and some form of impeccable evidence that what Luke believes in is real and has happened. And that is why when Luke writes his gospel, he speaks as a researcher. He says, the account I am writing for you, Theophilus, I have interviewed those who were his disciples. I have interviewed those he healed, those he raised from the dead. I have interviewed their relatives, their neighbors, and their friends. So what I'm writing to you, Theophilus, it is being backed up, not only by the dead who rose, not only by the sick who were healed, but also by their community that saw them die and saw them brought up to life, that saw them sick and saw them healed, that saw them hungry and saw them fed, that what I am reporting to you is a fact that the Messiah has indeed been born, and his name is Jesus, a Nazarene. And that is what the Gospel of Luke begins with, to tell Theophilus that the Messiah has been born, the root of David has arrived, the Savior of the world has been revealed, not in Greece, not in Rome, not in Istanbul, Turkey, but he has been revealed in Galilee, in Israel. The second theory is that what if Theophilus was a code name for a community of believers, maybe not believers in Jesus per se, but a community that was interested in Jesus, but was afraid and did not want to come out publicly unless there was clear evidence. What if this community that believed in Jesus was far from Jerusalem and it needed an account that it could believe in? As if in one way or another, Luke was writing his own version of the Bible for a community that needed to know an accurate report about this Jesus who is the savior of the world. This theory, of course, relies on the very name Theophilus, meaning the lover of God or a friend of God. And so there's been a view that this is a code name for a community that was interested in the gospel of Jesus Christ for a community that loved God, but this community, because it was far from Jerusalem, it needed a much more trustworthy report of what exactly had happened. And to this end, this account that he writes, he not only concludes it in one letter, but he writes it in two letters. First is the book of Luke, 
named after him. Second, it is the book of Acts. In fact, just to show that he is taking a research approach, even with the book of Acts, he uses phrases like, if you notice in verse 3, when he speaks about the resurrection of Jesus, he says he also presented himself alive after his suffering. How did Jesus present himself? By many infallible proofs. In other words, should you hear that Jesus did not resurrect, that the disciples stole his body and fake the resurrection, then Luke says, in my research, I have found infallible proofs. In other words, I have found evidence of those who saw him after the crucifixion and the burial. They did not see him once, but for 40 days, he presented himself among them. In the Gospel of Luke, in fact, Luke will tell us that there were nearly 500 witnesses who say and bear with their own eyes that after the crucifixion, burial, they saw Jesus of Nazareth alive with his wounds, yes, but he was alive. And so Luke in the book of Acts is continuing. And this is critical to our message for today. Because in the book of Luke, he is answering one question. What is salvation? Or how were we saved? And the book of Luke is written to answer the question that we were saved by God through Jesus Christ, who is the presence of God on earth. That is the answer. And when he has answered that, he writes the book of Acts. The book of Acts answers a different question, but that comes from the answer of the first one. The second question is, now that I am saved, what shall I do about it? What should I expect will happen? And he answers in writing this book of Acts, which answers, now that you are saved, now that you know how God has saved the world, what should that mean? Where should you go? What should you do? The first chapter answers exactly that. Now I know that Jesus saves. Now I believe that Jesus saves. What is the next step on this journey? This is what Luke is telling Theophilus. That once you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, here is what must happen next. And Theoph uh, uh, Luke begins by saying, Now Theophilus, you will remember the first account. In other words, it appears when he finished the book or the gospel according to Luke, he then posts it to Theophilus or to that entire congregation. He makes copies to Theophilus. Then he says, now that you have read part one, now that you understand what is salvation, now that you understand how God saved the world, mind you, very important, Luke was not a Jew. Many historians have documented his mother was a Jew, but his father was Greek. And the fact that his mother, being a Jew, married a Greek, suggests that his mother or his mother's family did not consider themselves strong, loyal, patriotic Jews. Jews did not marry other nations. Not unless they were of the liberal kind. Conservative Jews were very clear they do not marry outsiders. So, that also means in his upbringing, 
It is possible that while Luke may have heard of Yahweh, the God of Israel, or Jehovah as it is uh, translated in English, Luke would not necessarily have had very strong roots in terms of the Jewish religion. And it would be highly unlikely that he grew up with a solid jo Jewish experience. And as he writes, it shows in a way that he writes to a community or a person that thinks like him. Skeptics who do not have the advantage of uh, knowing the Jewish religion. But he writes to them, hence instead of taking a, a, a preaching route, he takes a research route because he's addressing a community that historically would not be pro the God of Israel. They wouldn't be familiar with the God of Israel. They wouldn't be uh, at, at ease with how the Jews believe. Hence, research is necessary because it appears whether Theophilus is an individual or a community, their approach to the gospel is more reasoned and researched. And it tells us and confirms that this is definitely a community outside of Israel being preached to by someone who comes from that community and understands where they would have problems with Jesus. So he is preaching the gospel in a way that meets their expectations. He knows how his people think. One thing I love and learn from Luke is how he took his knowledge of Jesus and packaged it in a way that he knew would answer his people's questions. Statistics suggest that all over the world, in all churches, we are losing 60% of our youth. Part of the problem is insisting on preaching to young people in a manner that the adults have decided without actually doing what Luke did. A successful pastor or minister has to find a way to take what is old and ancient and present it in a way that says, I know my people. I know their questions. I know their skepticism. And so I will give them this gospel, but in a manner that meets their expectations of assessing knowledge. Luke appears to have been successful because it appears he has sent the first epistle, the gospel according to Luke. And it appears that it has been received well enough that now they want to know more. It appears the second question, whether from Theophilus the individual or Theophilus the, 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 the community, it appears the second question has been asked. Now look, if we believe that Jesus is the savior of mankind, what do we do when we wake up tomorrow morning? What should this information mean to us? You've given us profound knowledge. You have given us earth-shattering knowledge. In your epistle, you've shown us the impossible. You've shown us God becoming flesh. You've shown us the dead rise. You've shown us the sick being healed. You've shown us the hungry thousands fed from a few uh, loaves of bread and fish. So surely in your first gospel, you have opened our eyes that what was impossible has actually happened. The world, while the world was busy with other things, lo and behold, in a country that we 
did not take seriously. God was saving all of us. Now the question, look, with such knowledge, what do we do? What should it mean to us? And in the book of Acts, now he responds to them. He answers this question. What does the gospel of Jesus mean once you've accepted it? You are now mind blown. You now believe that it is infallible that Jesus existed. It is infallible that he preached a gospel that he was. It is infallible that he died. It is infallible that he rose. The witnesses are in the hundreds. It is infallible that he went up to heaven. Now the question is, Theophilus that I am, what do I do with this information after I accept it and I believe? So Luke says, okay, Theophilus, seeing as I have given you the first account concerning Jesus, now I will introduce you to a second character in the story. Because you see, Theophilus, part one is about God. The one that we knew as God of the Jews only. That one has been resolved. He is the God who made all things. The Greeks, the Africans, the Asians. Everyone was made by him. Part two, I have answered you, Theophilus. He then saved the world that fell into sin after he had made it through Jesus Christ. Part three. Answers you, Theophilus. Now Luke says, now I introduce you to God in the Holy Spirit. That is the third person of the godliness project that is working to save us. Now this is what Luke says. When Christ knew that he is about to leave, Luke says, Speaking in the Holy Spirit, that is where now Luke introduces the Holy Spirit for the first time. But this is the reason why many theologians and historians have argued that the book of Acts should have been called the Acts of the, uh, 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 the Holy Spirit. In fact, focusing on this book, Ellen G. White called it the Acts of the Apostles. But there are many scholars, even non-Adventist scholars, who have suggested she should have called her book Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because even the book of Acts should have been called Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because the truth is, this book is about what the Holy Spirit is doing as the final stage of redemption. We have been saved in Jesus. Now the Holy Spirit is answering the question, what should I now do? In other words, how should life be lived differently than the life I used to live before I met Jesus? So Luke says, the first thing I want you to know is that Christ himself did everything through the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 1 and 2. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken away, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles he had chosen. And this is something that in the weeks to come, we are going to revisit and focus on. But already what a look is clear in understanding is that the Holy Spirit is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That even while Christ was on earth, the reason his words were so different. Do you remember when Jesus would speak? The people would say, he speaks with such authority. Where did he get his authority from? 
Because we've got many teachers, many rabbis, many professors, but none of them have taught us with the same authority as this son of Joseph. This is where the leaders of Israel were confused. He is the son of Joseph, yet he speaks as one who is wiser than all of us. How can the son of a carpenter with no formal education as they had it, how could he be so wise? How could his words carry so much power? How could he speak and the dead rise? How could he speak and food multiplies? Luke says, it is because in his very voice, in his very speech, the power of the Holy Spirit was in him. So Luke says, he spoke, he did, through the Holy Spirit. That is how Luke introduces the Holy Spirit. He says the Holy Spirit is the engine that propelled the gospel that is Jesus Christ. And so he says, now that we want to answer the question, how shall we live lives now that we are in Christ Jesus? We shall have to look closely at this person of the Holy Spirit. Because when we had to answer, how are we saved? We were, had to look closely to the person of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. When we had to answer, who is saving us? We had to look closely to the person of God that is revealed in the Old and the New Testament. When we had to ask, how are we saved? We had to look closely at the person of Jesus revealed in the Old and the New Testament. Now that we are going to be asking, how do we live life as the saved? We must again look closely at the person of the Holy Spirit revealed in the Old and the New Testament. So, then look begins that work by showing that the Holy Spirit has to be understood first from the words of Jesus himself and no other. He says, let me tell you, Theophilus, what happened. On the day that he was to be taken away, he commanded the disciples saying to them, they must not leave Jerusalem until the gift which he had promised them would come. He says to them, Jesus, John baptized with water, but I will now baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So you do not leave Jerusalem until I baptize you with the Holy Spirit. From Jesus' mouth, Jesus is the one that promises that he will give the Holy Spirit to the disciples. And so Luke says, so they waited on this, because this is what he had told them. And on that day he was taken away into heaven. But listen to his message. They will be baptized through the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit. And he tells them, in a few days time. He tells them that they do not need to wait for a very long time. They will receive this baptism. From there, now the issue comes, which is the focus of our message today. Jesus has made a clear statement. They will be baptized by the Holy Spirit. If this was told to me, then my next question to Jesus is, we know John baptized through water. 
he would put us under water and pick us up again. Now you say, you will baptize us through the Holy Spirit, yet you are leaving us. How will you in your absence baptize us with the Holy Spirit? And how? Because with John there was water. And John was physically there. So with John, the baptizer and the baptizing method was there. John the baptizer, water for the baptizing, the disciples for the baptized, everything was there. Jesus is living. The Holy Spirit has never been touched. How are we going to be baptized? And for some reason, that was not the most important question to them. Instead, this was the question that mattered to them the most. So, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Listen to that. What is their concern? Their concern is, when you say you will baptize us with the Holy Spirit, at that baptism, will that be the time you remove the Roman government from oppressing us? You restore the throne of David in Israel. You bring back all the ten tribes of Israel that were taken to captivity by the Assyrians in 722 BC. Will you at that time of the baptism bring all the 12 tribes together, restore the glorious kingdom that David had established? You see, they heard him say he would baptize them through the Holy Spirit. What they simply wanted that baptism to mean is that their greatest desires are fulfilled. How was the baptism to work for them? Whatever the baptism means, they did not concern themselves with what it means. They wanted its outcome to be the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. Let us look at a few things in that statement. So they say to him, At will you, Lord, at that time? So the time issue. The time issue. Remember, there's a time problem in this story. He said, not so many days from now, I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So, the time issue, will you Lord at that time, let's rephrase it according to what Jesus said. Will you Lord in a few days time? Because at that time of baptism, he said in a few days time. So, will you, Lord, in a few days' time, restore? That is the second issue. He said he will baptize them with the Holy Spirit. So, they equate baptism to restoration. Baptism to restoration. So, will you, Lord, in a few days' time, restore? In other words, will you, Lord, in a few days' time, baptize us? Okay? Because he said he will baptize. They understand the baptism to be restoration in a few days' time. They understand his few days. Hence, they say at that time. So there's an equivalent. Where Jesus says in a few days, they say time. Where he says baptize, they say restore. Lastly, he says to them, I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. They say, restore the kingdom of Israel. So they substitute the Holy Spirit 
for the kingdom of Israel. So, Jesus says, In a few days' time, I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. They ask, Are you telling us in a few days' time you will restore the kingdom of Israel? In other words, in a few days' time, you are going to restore, that is the baptism, the kingdom of Israel, that is the Holy Spirit. So for them, the Holy Spirit is the kingdom restored. That's what they want. They want the kingdom restored. Jesus responds and says to them, it is not for you to know the times. Underline the word no because it is critical in what we are dealing with. He says it is not for you to know the seasons which the father has put in his own authority. So number one, he shatters their expectations by saying, I am not denying that the kingdom will be restored. I, however, am telling you that the time I am talking about and the event I am talking about is not the one you are hearing. He is not saying the kingdom shall never be restored. He is saying even when God restores the kingdom, the timing for that and the season has not been made available to you. So he doesn't deny that one day the kingdom of God shall be restored. That is not. Of course, why would he deny it? He has been preaching it. He has been saying the kingdom of God has come and now is. So he can't deny that there is a restoration of the kingdom. He is simply saying the fulfillment of the restoration is not what I'm talking about. When it comes to the restoration of the kingdom of God, I will not discuss it with you because its times and seasons belong to the Father and have not been given to you. Then he says to them, and here is as if he's saying, but here is what concerns you. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and up to the end of the earth. Now that is the key. Please follow very carefully what has been happening all along. You see the disciples, the disciples had a problem. Listen very carefully. In verse 5. Jesus promised them baptism through the Holy Spirit. In verse 6, they equate baptism in the Holy Spirit to restoration of the kingdom of Israel. Jesus corrects them, verse 7, by addressing the issue, by calling it knowing. He says, you want to know, please pay attention, you want to know times and seasons. But listen to Jesus in verse 8. I am not offering you knowledge. I am offering you power. In other words, in verse 5, when I say I will baptize you, in the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, I am saying to you, you are going to be given power. You want to know times and seasons. I want to give you power. Let us see the problem here. It's knowledge versus power. He promised them power. They want knowledge. I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. They don't want that power. They want knowledge about when God will restore the kingdom. 
They are exchanging power for knowledge. They want knowledge, not the power. That's the issue here. Now, knowledge in the Greco-Roman Hellenistic world, there were three words in Greek that were used where knowledge is concerned. The first word, episteme. This is knowledge that is objective, abstract, and universal. Episteme. The second word that was used for knowledge was doxa. Doxa is subjective, personal, particular knowledge. That is doxa, based on your experience. The third word was gnosis, from which actually the word know and knowledge come from. Gnosis means enlightenment, awareness. Gnosis was usually used in a context of spirituality. When you believe, when, when, when you are enlightened, you would have Gnosis. That is why Gnosticism. You now get it? Because Gnosticism is a belief that we are saved through special knowledge. Because Gnosis is a spiritual knowledge. Interestingly, within those three words, when Jesus speaks of you want to know, Jesus uses gnosis, okay, but in a very specific context, because gnosis in one of its derivatives is ginesco. I know, ginesco, which has the same root, root as gnosis, ginesco, I know. Ginesco, I know, I understand, I am enlightened. So he says to them, you want to be enlightened about things that God will do at the end of time. But look at the interplay. Because they said, Lord, will you at this time, time, time is an abstract concept. Time is a universal concept. Time is an episteme kind of knowledge. It is universal objective knowledge. Time is the episteme. Then they say, will you at that time restore the kingdom? Restore, in other words, put back the kingdom for us. Because it's our kingdom. It's not the world's kingdom. It's the kingdom of Israel that falls under the doxa, the particular knowledge, our knowledge, will the universal God at that time, will the universal God restore our kingdom that others are not invited into? And this will be the kingdom of Israel. Personal. Do you see? That's another challenge. These guys are still not thinking globally. They are still thinking locally. They worship a universal God, but they have no global thinking about his presence. Listen to what he says in the end. You guys will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. God is global. They are very local at their thinking at this time. Their dreams are for the restoration of Israel. They have no dream bigger than that. Yet the one who has saved them says, No, this is not just about your homeland. Yes, it will begin in your homeland, in your home city, Jerusalem. It will spread to Judea, your country. It will go to Samaria, your sub-region. Then it will go to the whole world. There are so many Christians who 
who love the universal God, but their application of him is very limited and local. You've got many Seventh-day Adventists who believe in a universal God, but they don't understand him acting outside the church. It is a very sad state to rub shoulders with the global God, but only think about him in local terms. It is a very narrow-minded approach that we worship a universal God, but for some reason, you are unable to identify his global presence. You can only relate when he is working locally. And Jesus is challenging them to say, I can't give you the Holy Spirit just to solve local matters only. He's not saying local matters won't be solved. He is saying we will solve local, national, regional, and global issues with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not coming to address just the issues of your family. He will address you, your family, your relatives, your community, your country, your continent, and ultimately the whole world. Therefore, those who believe in God must be very clear. The revelation may start local, but the impact has to be global. Whatever God is to you, if he only works for you in your house, there's a problem. He is like a lion that is tied and eats with puppies in the back of a house. You cannot take the king of the savannah, a global animal, and tie it on a pole with domestic dogs. You are misusing the power of the lion. You cannot have the Holy Spirit but only pray to solve your local problems. With the Holy Spirit, we must solve local, regional, national, and global problems. We must pray for us and for the world. We must work for us and for the world. That is what Jesus is challenging, that you need to understand. We are not just solving Israel's issues here. We are solving a global issue. The second and final thing. Jesus didn't say, when the Holy Spirit has come, you will receive knowledge. He says you will receive power. Because this is power versus knowledge. And what is it about? You see, Jesus is telling us something critical. Jesus is saying to us, the world is not short of knowledge. The problem in the world, we have no power to act on what we know. Or we are not willing to act on what we know. We live in the era of knowledge. Never has the world been connected like right now. The most advanced phone when I was a teenager was a Nokia 3310. That was the most advanced phone launched in our times. When we could email, the world changed. We could tell a whole story we could write a whole book and release it. The stiffy disc or the floppy disc as some call it. Some don't even know what a floppy disc looked like. It was the most advanced storage device when I was at university for the first time. Look at today. Today a cell phone has more memory capacity than some laptops. 
Some cell phones have more speed and ability to process than a computer does. We are in the age of knowledge. In the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, 60s, and 70s, it took us 10, 20 years to develop a vaccine. In the 2020s, it took us one year to develop a vaccine. This is the era of knowledge. Today, a doctor in Cape Town, South Africa, using robotic arms, a screen, video camera, and 5G internet connection can perform a surgery on a patient in Germany under a robot arms. The doctor in South Africa cuts on a screen. The robots in Germany cut the flesh. We are in the era of knowledge. Yet with all our knowledge, we are failing to solve the world's most basic problems. In the highest era of knowledge, the world's hungriest populations have risen. Abuse is more prevalent than ever before. The rise of right-wing extremists both the patriarchal and the racist extremists have reason. What is the problem? Jesus answers us. Knowledge will not save this world. This world needs power to act on what it knows. The famous African thinker and activist, Professor Patrice Lumumba from Kenya, he makes an interesting observation. He says only in Africa are those with ideas but have no power. And those who have power have no ideas. That's the problem. The world is not short of ideas. The world is not short of brains that are thinking new things. The problem is there is not enough power for us to effect those ideas. Firstly, there is the earthly power, which is limited and concentrated in the hands of the few. And those few, the majority of those few, are men and they are white. Then comes other men. Then comes later white women. And then we will not even discuss others. They don't even show up. That's the challenge. But Jesus here is not just talking about the power from earth. You see, Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come. This power is different. Why? It does not act on earth alone. It acts in heaven as well. The power that the Holy Spirit will bring when we are baptized with it. We will not just have ideas that will change this world. But our ideas will be connected with heaven and they will transform earth. Our power will not just be earthly relevant. The power that the Holy Spirit will bring, it will be derived from heaven, but it will be used on earth. Its source is divine. Its beneficiaries are earthly. This power is what we need. And Jesus says, the carrier of that power is the Holy Spirit. When he comes upon you, when he overshadows you, you will receive power. And you will not be like the politicians. You will not be like the criminals. You will not be like an army. You will not be like any earthly power. Whether it's the American army or the Taliban. 
whether it's the ANC or ZANU PF or, or, or the Democrats or the Republicans or the Tories or the Labour Party, it will not be that power. That is human manufactured power. That power has destroyed the world. Through that power, we have created global warming. Through that power, we have created racism. Through that power, we have created sexism. Through that power, we have created classism. Jesus says the power that is coming, it is manufactured in heaven. And all earth will bow to its authority. However, you need to be ready to exchange knowledge for power. Because it's not knowledge that you are short of. You are short of power. Pe too many people know too many things today. We are a planet of knowers. We have more master's degrees, PhDs, and, and undergrads and honors and certificates than the world has ever had. We have more researchers, more publications, more universities, more journals than the world has ever had. Jesus says to his disciples, stop your obsession with knowledge. Knowledge will not change this world. You need power. We need power. In the world we are living in, we are not short of ideas anymore. We are not even lacking knowledge. The problem is we have no power. Even what the, the rich and the powerful call power, Jesus says that's not power. You don't have power until you can speak and there is a movement on both heaven and earth. Oh, I love that. No one has, until your prayer moves heaven and earth, you haven't tasted power. Jesus says there's no power there. Jesus says that's why you must pray in my name. Because I am the only one that has moved heaven and earth. When you pray in my name. Your prayer will effect itself in heaven and on earth. And Jesus says, now that I'm leaving you, I leave you with the Holy Spirit and he will give you power. We need power. If we are going to make this world a better place and be present also in heaven one day, we are going to need power, power that can act and play and move both dimensions. We don't need political power. It only works in countries, in parliaments. We need power that can act in parliament and also act in heaven. And Jesus says, the Holy Spirit has that power. And he will give it to you when you receive him. How do we receive him? It is already clear. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it is Jesus who gives the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now do you see the process? Jesus gives the Holy Spirit to those who believe in him. The Holy Spirit gives power to those who have received him. And so our prayer is, Lord Jesus, help me believe in you, that you may baptize me with your spirit, that I may receive power. Power not only to change my life and the situation in my family, but power to change my country, my continent, and the world. Power to change not only me as a man, but the man of my country, the man of my race, the man of my continent, and the man of the world. Power 
the power that we need does not reside in the White House. It doesn't reside at the Union buildings. It's not at number 10 Downing Street. It's not at Westminster Abbey. It's not in Berlin. It's not in the Kremlin. It is not in Beijing. The power we need, the power we need resides with the Holy Spirit. And this power has the ability to command heaven and earth at the same time. With that power, you and I, we wouldn't just wait for Jesus to come again. We would change the world now. And then we would wait for him to return and change us for the final time. The Holy Spirit has power. You and I need that power desperately. We can get it. He is not hiding it. It is available. It's power that he gives when Jesus instructs him to give it. And Jesus instructs it to be given by the Holy Spirit to those who believe in him. I have access to the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. And my prayer today, may you receive power, may I receive power. May our faith in Jesus now connect us to the dynamus, the greatest power the universe has ever known. It is power that comes from the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells us the territory of that power. He says it will start in Jerusalem to work. Then it will work in Judea. Then it will work in Samaria. Then it will be felt in the whole world. In other words, in my context, Jesus is saying the power will begin in, in Durban. Then power will go out into South Africa. Then power will be felt in Africa. And then power will be felt in the whole world. I want that power not to be loved and be popular and famous, but so that with that power, as Jesus said, then you will be my witnesses. You will witness of my power in your life. You will witness of my power in your country. You will witness of my power in your continent and you will witness of my power in the whole world we do not need more politicians more armies more guns more nuclear weapons none of those things have the power we need the power the world needs is in the holy spirit and i pray that god may shower us with the holy spirit that from him we may receive this power. Let's pray. Our God and our Father who is in heaven, one thing we ask for now in the name of Jesus, that Jesus we declare that we believe in you as the Savior of all mankind. Now we ask, baptize us with your Holy Spirit, O God, that we may receive power and with that power we may witness for you we pray heavenly father give us give us the holy spirit that in us and through us may flow the power that will make this world a better place we know a lot we know a lot in this world and with our knowledge we have destroyed each other now we need power. And we know that you, Holy Spirit, you hold the power. And we know that you, Jesus, you dismiss that power when you baptize through the Holy Spirit. Baptize us, then we pray. 
Baptize us, then we pray, that we may receive this power. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could think or imagine, to him who is able to present us faultless and blameless before the throne of grace, to the only true God, invisible and incorruptible, be salvation, be power and be glory and majesty, till that day when we shall see you come in the clouds. May we receive the power to change this world as your witnesses. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.